Hello, there we go. Praise the Lord. Good to see you guys again this morning. I was starting to think a little rain would dissuade a few people from showing up this morning. So glad to see you guys braved it and got your arcs out and made your way out the alley. Would uh, anybody uh, be in need of a Bible this morning? If so, just raise your hand. We'll get one to you. We're always glad to share the Word of God with you, but we always love that you can read along with us as we go through it together. All right, if everybody's all set. I saw Steve and Kim walk in. Steve didn't even stand up this time because he knows you guys are all packing all the time. You're all ready to go. So... But this morning we're going to be in uh, Luke chapter 18, so if you would turn there with me. We began Luke 18 last time, and we got to verse 30. We're going to be looking at verse 31 on today. Luke chapter 18, starting in verse 31. Luke records, Then he, Jesus, took the twelve aside and said to them, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man will be accomplished or fulfilled. For he will be delivered to the Gentiles, and will be mocked and suited, uh, uh, insulted and spit upon. And they will scourge him and kill him, and the third day he will rise again. But they understood none of these things. This saying was hidden from them, and they did not know the things which were spoken. Now, Father, we just pray that uh, these things would not be hidden from our sights this morning, but rather we would understand them, that we'd be able to take deep into our hearts those things that your word would say to us. As we study it, Lord, we desire for it not to simply be something that uh, speaks to our minds only, although we do desire that, but we also desire for you to reach into our hearts, that, Father, you might effect change, reach deep into the seat of the emotion of all that who we are, and speak to us that we might follow you with a sense of passion. So we thank you for these words and pray that as we begin with them today that you would help us understand them and apply them. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we have mentioned for a couple of weeks uh, now, uh, we're getting ever closer, inching our way really to the cross. Ultimately, Jesus will be going to Jerusalem very soon. He's he's on his way, but he'll actually enter Jerusalem. Uh, We'll look at that next week. Of course, we looked at it uh, on Good Friday, or I should say on Palm Sunday. But we will revisit it again next week as we come to it here in Luke's Gospel. But in terms of where Jesus is on the timeline of his ministry, he is literally very much uh, coming up to the doorstep of Jerusalem, the triumphal entry as we come to call it. And not only Jerusalem, but also the cross. This is ultimately why he's going. And he has been mentioning periodically in his ministry, and this is one such case, he has been speaking to them about what he's going to do when he gets to Jerusalem. And this stands in stark contrast to what their expectation would be about what he would do when he got to Jerusalem. Uh, As a matter of fact, you'll notice here again in the passage we just read in verse 34, it mentions how they understood none of these things that he told them. Uh, Now we read the passage and it seems clear enough, doesn't it? I'll go to Jerusalem, I'll be insulted, I'll be crucified, on the third day I'll rise again. The wording itself is not complicated to understand or to hear and to understand what's being said. So why did they have a hard time understanding these things? Two possible reasons. One is that the Lord did for some reason sort of uh, hide it from them from fully understanding. Uh, It is possible that that's the case. I, I tend to think, I lean toward that not being the case. I think it is more likely the fact that they were expecting something different of their Messiah. Um, They would not have necessarily understood this idea of the two elements, if you will, of Jesus' ministry. The fact that he would, yes, come in power and conquer Israel's enemies and ultimately set up a kingdom and rule and reign from Jerusalem. These are things that they looked forward to wholeheartedly. They would worship him full-throatedly because they looked with such anticipation to this coming. As a matter of fact, when we were in Israel some years ago, uh, we were under the Temple Mount area. And uh, as they were leading us through these giant stones that were that formed the base of, of, of the Temple Mount, uh, a shofar was blown in the distance, and our guide, who is not a Christian, he was uh, Jewish, he began to immediately respond to that with, Messiah is coming, he's even here. The excitement was just just sparked in him. Uh, and and it's, this, this certainly would have been at a fever pitch in Jesus' ministry. Again, we'll see next week 
where Jesus comes into Jerusalem riding on a donkey and the people lay down the palm branches, they are out of their minds with excitement when he arrives on this day. Well, that fever has been building. There's a lot of attention drawn to Jesus about who he is and what he might be. Could he be the Messiah? And so when Jesus is speaking to his disciples about going up to Jerusalem, that part is beginning to just bring a certain amount of excitement to them because they are thinking this is the time when he will declare himself to be the Messiah, that the time has come, we've been following him, and now the day will be here. But So when Jesus says things like, I'm going to be crucified, I'm going to die, and then the third day rise again, these are not within the framework that they are expecting, anticipating. Uh, it is not really until we understand in the New Testament uh, you know, in the writings of the New Testament that we begin to understand fully how these things appeared in the Old Testament, but they were not clear to them. And so they didn't understand these things. The word there to be hidden from their eyes does speak of something that is intentionally hidden, but again, it's unclear whether that means that the Holy Spirit was sort of blocking their understanding or whether it was simply their own misunderstanding of his mission that caused this. But I'd like to also point to a couple of other things that, as we come through this passage here. It says that he took the twelve aside and said to them, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem. Now, for starters, you always go up to Jerusalem. If you've ever been to Israel, if you've ever been to Jerusalem, you know that no matter which direction you come to Jerusalem from, you go up to go there. It's on a hill. It's, it's, it's raised up. It's, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's the kind of place that you make your way up to. So that's a literalism. Uh, not simply a geographic of going from one point to another up in terms of north or something, but simply speaking of the fact that we're going up to Jerusalem, this is the way they would typically speak about it. But notice here again, he says, we are going up to Jerusalem. There have been a number of times in his ministry when Jesus would often make the point about what he was going to accomplish there. He would suffer. He would go to the cross. He would be despised. He would be rejected. He would be turned aside from... Uh, the people would reject him. Here, very noticeably, he speaks of how we are going to Jerusalem. Now, the cross that Jesus would bear on that, on that Good Friday, if you will, on that particular day, would be his and his alone to bear. However, the fact that they were going to go with him, I think sets something of a model for what everybody who follows Jesus ultimately will one day have to come face to face with, and that is a cross. There is no way to follow Jesus devoid of accepting the cross. That's part of it. As a matter of fact, it's the heart of it. We are going to Jerusalem. Jesus has also often spoken to them about the cost of discipleship, saying things like, you need to take up your cross daily and follow after me. Now, we hear a term like this, and if, you, if you've been here for any length of time, you've probably heard me say this, but if you haven't, the, when Jesus says, take up your cross and follow him, he's not simply speaking about some burden in your life that's difficult to bear as a Christian. What, when Jesus spoke of the cross to them, put yourself in their sandals and imagine the context in which they would hear those words, because though, that's the context in which Jesus spoke it. He wasn't thinking 20th century, okay, there's difficulty with walking with Jesus. It's hard. My cross to bear is my, uh, you know, some, some difficulty I have in, in ministry or something. That's not what it is. It may include that, but that's not what it is. When Jesus told the disciples that they should take up their cross and follow after him, otherwise, ultimately, they're not worthy of him, what that meant was they needed to be willing, and even on a practical level daily, to die, to die. There's, there's no reason to ever try to pretty that up. That is the intended message of take up your cross and follow after me. It speaks of crucifying the self, putting to death the old man, and walking with Jesus with such a sense of surrender that when he says go, you go. When he says come, you come. When he says jump, you say how high. There's no question about who's the Lord of, the, of, of your life. There's no question about who it is that is ultimately running your ship, who's driving this thing. When we accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, the Savior part is very easy for us to embrace. He saved me from my sins. I now know that I'm not going to hell. I'm forgiven. I've been washed clean. I've been given a new start. But with that new start is connected the idea of not 
going back and picking up all the old stuff that you needed a new start from. Because when he's your Lord, he's going to lead you away from those things. But you will only follow him there if he's your Lord. And so we ask to be our Lord and Savior. Those two things are inextricably linked. It's not enough for us to have the fire insurance, as we've said. He calls us to follow after him. To follow after him. As a matter of fact, in Hebrews, where it talks about Jesus being the author and finisher of our faith, uh, that word author there speaks of like a trailblazer. It's one who goes first. He kind of opens the trail that you might follow. Uh, I like to think of it in these terms. If, if, uh, if, if we were going through the jungle, suppose... I uh, suppose Randy was a safari leader, and he had the whole get up on the hat and stuff. He pulls out the machete, and he's hacking his way through the jungle and everything, and the group is following him. We're all following after him. Uh, and there's no way to tell what's out there on, on either side of the brush, and the only way we know how to go anywhere at all is because he's making a path for us. If we go off the path, we're lost. We don't know how to get back. We can't find our way. It's only by staying on this path that we can make our way through to where we're going, and it's because he's making the way. That's Jesus. He's clearing the path so that we can go. It's a narrow one, albeit, but it's the path to go. And so he blazes the trail. He is the author of our faith. He set the course. He made the path. He made the way. And hence he would say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. Why? Because all there is is lostness in the brush. It's only on this path. We have to follow him. He's the author and he's the finisher which means he's the one that takes us home. He's the one who seals it and completes it. He's the beginning and the end of this whole thing. He's our Lord. So he says, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man will be accomplished. All things that are written by the prophets. And he goes on to explain that those things include the fact that he will be insulted, he will ultimately be crucified, and he will die. And he will rise again on the third day. All the things that the prophets have spoken of. In John chapter 5, verse 24, Jesus told the Pharisees, uh, in a way he commended them and condemned them all in the same breath. He commended them because they were students of the scripture. But he condemned them because he, he told them that they studied the scriptures because it was in them that they thought they had eternal life. But it is they which speak of me, it is they which testify of me. What scriptures? Which ones in specific? I don't think Jesus intended to be specific. Why? Because all of it does. In one capacity or another, all of the what we would call the Old Testament, in his day what he would call the scriptures, all of it pointed to him. It's as if the Old Testament, even as Paul would say in Galatians 3, the Old Testament served as a road map to help keep us between the lines so we would, we would, when Jesus came, we'd get to him, we'd see him, he'd be clear. Signposts to lead the way and say, here he is, this is the one. Genesis 3.15, the seed of the woman. He'll crush your head, Satan. You'll strike at his heel, but he'll crush your head. Isaiah 7.14, behold, a virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. His name will be Emmanuel. All of these passages, some familiar, some less so, but all of these passages pointing to him, so much so that on the road to Emmaus, and which one of us would not give anything to get a, uh, an MP3 of this Bible study In in, uh, Luke chapter 24, when Jesus is walking on the road to Emmaus with two disciples, he sort of catches up with them as they're making their way, and they're talking, and Jesus says, hey guys, what's up? What are you talking about? And they said, what are you, the only person around here? Where are you from that you don't know what's going on? Didn't you hear about Jesus? A prophet, mighty in word and deed, we thought he might be the Christ, the Son of God, the, the, the Messiah. But here he is, he's been dead these three days. And Jesus went on to say, Oh foolish and slow of heart to believe what? All that the prophets have spoken. In other words, Jesus came not to sort of set aside the Old Testament, just start some brand flashy new thing. He came to fulfill that which had always been the plan of God from the very beginning. As a matter of fact, when John in the book of Revelation is, he gets this vision of heaven and he sees a lamb as it had been slain from the foundation of the world. I'm so fond of pointing out that the cross was not plan B in God's plan. It was always plan A. The cross was always the intended destination of Jesus' earthly ministry. And then he rose from the dead to show that he conquered death. The cross, his death, 
death itself could not hold him because he was sinless. He conquered it. So the things that he speaks about here, as he refers to that which all the prophets have spoken, these things he has come to fulfill. He's Even as he would say in John, I've not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill. And now he's going to make his way to Jerusalem to do this very thing. And he tells them this. Now what's interesting is as we go through the passages we're going to look at today, including uh, the parable he'll tell uh, toward the beginning of chapter 19, uh, we will see that he is trying to prepare them for something as they come up to Jerusalem. They're excited about one thing, but he's trying to make clear to them something else. And we'll learn more about this in just a moment. But first, we continue in verse 35. Then it happened that as he was coming near Jericho, that a certain blind man uh, sat by the road begging. And hearing a multitude passing by, he asked what it meant. And so they told him that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by. And he cried out, saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Then those who went before warned him uh, that he should be quiet, but he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And so Jesus stood still and commanded him to be brought to him. And when he had come near, he asked him, saying, What do you want me to do for you? And he said, Lord, that I may receive my sight. And then Jesus said to him, Receive your sight, your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise to God. Now, we know from, uh, actually from, um, excuse me, we know from uh, from uh, Matthew and Mark that there are other details to this story. For example, uh, the blind man's name was Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus. Uh, we also know there were two of them uh, that ultimately were before Jesus crying out, son of David, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on us. Uh, however, Luke, Jesus, uh, Luke, and I believe it's Mark, uh, points to just one of the two, apparently the more vocal of the two, and begins to ask, uh, uh, and hears him crying out. The people tell them to settle down and to be quiet, but that only sparks them to cry out all the more. And so Jesus then stops, and he asks them, what do you want me to do for you? Now, what do they cry out? Jesus, son of David. Now, what's interesting about that terminology is that it's not just messianic, it's messianic on the one hand because God promised when David wanted to build God a house, you remember in, uh, uh, is it 2 Samuel, where God desires to build a temple for God? But David's a man of war. And so God tells Nathan the prophet, who's kind of uh, misguidedly sparked David to go ahead and begin this whole thing. Uh, God says to Nathan, he spoke a little too, heavy, too quickly, go tell David that if there's too much blood on his hands, he's not going to build me a house, but because of what is in his heart, I will build him a house. And he begins to share how the Messiah will come from David's family tree. So, son of David is a messianic term, but it also, by definition, speaks of his lineage. Because he's going to come from the house of David. It's not just a generic term, it's actually a very literal family term. In David's family tree, the Messiah will come. Which is to say that apparently, and I would have to surmise that since, since uh, Bartimaeus was blind, he could not have necessarily researched this about Jesus himself, but apparently he'd heard it about him which is to say that it was apparently becoming somewhat known that at very least David, uh, Jesus' family tree did run through David, which meant he was qualified, at least in that regard, to be the Messiah, which would only have sparked all the interest all the more. But notice what they crowd. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on us. And when Jesus finally stops and he says, what would you have me do for you? They ask for their sight. Now, no doubt Jesus knew what they wanted, but he wanted them to ask. Why? Because God always wants us to ask. The Bible says that he knows what we need ever, even before we ask. But nevertheless, he invites us to come. I love their persistence. They're crying out, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on us. And the people say, quiet down, quiet down. But they cry out all the more. They're persistent. They will not quiet down. Why? Because this is their chance to meet with Jesus and to ask him for something to help them. And so they will not be quiet. They will not pipe down. They will not settle down and go to the back and just let this crowd go by with Jesus without making their, making their requests known to him. It's persistent prayer, in other words. They will not stop until they get to him. It's a tremendous picture. You know, in, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, it says that those who would come to God, you know, for those who would come to God, they need to come to him both knowing that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Okay? 
Without faith, it is impossible to please God. And those who would come to him must come to him believing that A, he is, and B, that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Now, remember how Jesus told the disciples to pray in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, ask and you'll receive. Knock and the door will be open. Seek and you'll find. Each of those Greek words imply a certain amount of persistence. Ask, continue, please ask, continue to ask. Knock, please knock, as if, as if beckoning to the one to continue until there's a response. And then Jesus goes on to, to, to say something audacious. He says, he says, which one is being wicked? If your son asks for bread, would you give him a stone? Will not your heavenly Father give good things to those who ask him? In other words, it's God's desire to do good for those who seek him, especially his children. He said he brings rain on the just and the unjust. That's a good thing, not like today where it's keeping us from running out to our cars without getting drenched. Rain in their day would be good news because it would help the crops to grow. And God is saying, I will be good to both the just and the unjust, but especially so to his children. The unjust have no right to expect it, but his children do. That's not a presumptuous thing. Jesus said, when you pray, pray like this. Father, Abba, Daddy, blessed be your name. And along the prayer, he says, make your request be your name. Now, give us this day our daily bread. There's nothing spiritualized about that. It's practical. Lord, I need to eat. Please provide for me. So this, these two guys come up, and we'll focus on Bartimaeus here because that's who's, who's in, in view ultimately, but they come before him, and they, they won't stop until they get to him. I will confess, I wish my prayer life was this desperate. You know, not only the fact that he's persistent, but he really believes Jesus is going to do something about this, right? If I can just get to Jesus, then I know this can be, this can, this can be fixed, this can, I can be healed. And he won't stop until he gets to him. Jesus rewards that. Why? Because this man believes that Jesus will. And notice there, he wants to receive his sight, so he makes his request known. And Jesus says, your faith has made you well. Now in Mark's gospel, he says, go your way. Your faith has made you well. Two things there. First off, your faith has made you well. It doesn't mean there's inherent power in faith in and of itself. It's the one in whom the faith is placed. It's like I think what Spurgeon said, you know, it's, it's, it's not that I have great faith, but I have a little faith in a great God. Jesus, anyway, he said, you have faith like a mustard seed. You can say to this mountain, be removed and thrown into the sea. A mustard seed is not intended to be given as a quantifiable amount of faith to have. If you have at least this much that you can hold in your hand and say, well, I have this much, mountain be moved. No, the idea is that you have faith at all, but it's in, it's in who you've placed that faith that determines what happens. Now, God is sovereign. God always chooses that which brings him glory and which is ultimately for our good. Okay, those two things are always in play. If our request violates either of those two things, then he will not answer. Why? Because in answering it, he will be doing that which does not bring him glory or is, or is ultimately in our best good. We don't know the ultimate playing out of whatever prayer he answers. He does. And so when God says yes, no, or wait, those are all viable and, and good answers. Even no. Okay, it's not always yes. And you know what? Thank God it's not always yes. You know, uh, uh, Ruth Graham tells the story of prior to meeting Billy, how she bloodied her knuckles on the gates of heaven, crying out for this particular, one particular man or another who she thought would be the perfect husband. And each time, God just would not bring this person to her. Yet she, they would, and, until finally she met Billy. That great theologian Garth Brooks once said, thank God for unanswered prayers. That's not theologically correct. Not, no prayers are unanswered. Just sometimes the answer is no. And thank God that it is. But sometimes it's yes. And just because God is sovereign, we should never take a nihilistic view of that where it's hopeless to really pray or ask or anything because after all, God's going to do whatever God's going to do anyway. No, ask. Jesus said ask. Continue to ask. Ask with perseverance. Come before him with an expectancy that he will answer. Ask. Just because God is sovereign does not mean that we should take lightly our opportunity to seek him with fervency and intensity. We ought to do this. No great saint in all of church history that you've ever heard about when it came to the subject of prayer was not known for being on their face before God. Prayer was not a light thing. Uh, again, I have so much respect for, the, for these guys. They would not stop 
until they had seen Jesus. Until not well, they did see him ultimately, but until they got to Jesus. And then secondly, notice this, that they received their sight immediately and they followed him. Jesus said, go your way, your faith has made you well. The way they chose to go was to follow him. And ultimately their lives became a testimony that caused others to glorify God as well. That is the natural outworking of God working in our lives. You know, the, like the hymn, you know, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound, uh, that saved a wretch, not, not saved and found me, it was saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was what? Was blind, but now I see. Right? You may not physically, literally have been blind in terms of not being able to see out of your eyes, but you were blind spiritually to the point where God had to save you and help you to see the truth. And as a result of that, our lives become a living testimony, trophies of grace for what God can do. And others will glorify God. This is, this is the pattern, and I respect these guys so much for how this entirely played out in their lives so naturally. Now, chapter 19 starts where a similar, uh, uh, well, uh, at least metaphorically, another blindness ultimately is healed. We'll look at this here as we move into chapter 19. Then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Now, when we speak about Jericho, we actually just saw this earlier in the previous passage as well. Um, as you read the Gospels, you'll see in one place where it says he was leaving Jericho, another place in the same instant he was entering Jericho. There are actually, historically, two Jerichos there. One is the original city that was ultimately fell during the time of Joshua, but there was also a, a, a Jericho that Herod built uh, that ultimately was close by there. And so it's actually uh, very possible as he's leaving the one, entering the other, that these things are taking place. Uh, one is much grander, what was much grander than the one that, is, that stood in Jesus' time. Uh, but, but anyway, that's, if you're confused by that, that's, that's what's going on there. Now, behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. Uh, you may have heard of him. Zacchaeus was a wee little man. A wee little man was he. And, uh, and this is where we learned this from. Zacchaeus, who was a chief tax collector. <laughs> yeah, this is such a bad assignment. Was it, uh, was it uh, uh, what was the guy who used to read song lyrics as poetry? Some of you who are a little bit older will remember watching him on TV. He's one of those guys with three names. And he would get up here and he'd read, you know, Bebop Alula, she's my baby. <laughs> Bebop Alula, I don't mean, maybe. And it just did a serious reading of and this song, and I forget, oh, what is his name? It's not Steve Harvey, not, um, not Steve Lawrence. Anyway, whatever, it's not important, but uh, I always get a kick out of that kind of thing. I'm simple. <laughs> so, now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus who was uh, a chief tax collector, and he was rich. Uh, and he sought to see who Jesus was, but could not because of the crowd, for he was of short stature. So he ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass that way. Now, we know a few things about Zacchaeus here. Of course, again, as we kind of joked about, he's little, he's of small stature, he's a short guy. Uh, which, by the way, uh, typically, ethnically, Jewish people tend to be short anyway. They're not generally, you don't... Not a lot of Jewish folks in the NBA, for example. It's just, it's ethnically, that's just not typically the case. And that's just, that's just a Middle Eastern trait. So for them to mention Zacchaeus was short, or small stature, by that standard he was short. So he's a little person. He's, he's a short person. And he has a logistical issue when it comes to seeing Jesus when he comes to town. The blind men had another logistical issue. They could not physically see him because they were blind. Uh, Zacchaeus cannot see him because the crowd is all bigger than him and he can't literally see him. So he, he does something. And, and remember, this is purely out of curiosity. He doesn't necessarily believe in Jesus at this point. It just says he wants to know who Jesus is. This is pure curiosity. There's nothing faith about this so much. I just want to see who he is. What's all the commotion about with this guy? So he does something that he has to do logistically. He climbs a sycamore tree, and he gets up on a branch where he can see. That's all. It's, 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 it's a very simple thing that's going on here. He's not getting out there so he can just reach out and touch Jesus. No, he just wants to see him because he does Who is this guy? Number one, he's little. Number two, his own circle of influence and the people he'd hang out with would have generally no dealings with religious people. It says Zacchaeus was a tax collector and he was rich. You know how he got rich? He got rich by extorting the people for money because a tax collector made a living by collecting above what was owed and whatever they collected above what was owed was theirs. 
Now, what made it worse is that Zacchaeus, whose name, by the way, means righteous one, uh, is, is somebody who is a Jew who is serving Rome, collecting taxes from his own people. So he is absolutely outcast and hated by his own people. Nobody likes him, except for other people that nobody likes. And he's little, which means he's probably not very tough. He's, he's got the, the weight of Rome behind him as a tax collector, although the truth is that if something happened to Zacchaeus, Rome would be more concerned about the taxes they didn't collect than about Zacchaeus himself. So he's not loved by anybody. He's not respected by anybody. He's little, so he's probably made fun of. Everything about this guy is wrong. And he, he knows it. And he feels it every single day. So maybe he's heard something about Jesus and he just wants to see for himself. So he gets up in this tree and he's looking and he's watching and here comes Jesus walking by. Now, when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste or hurry up and come down for today I must stay at your house. Now that probably shocked Zacchaeus. Matter of fact, he may have fell out of the tree. He may have come down really quick. First off, what a surprise. Second of all, nobody invites Zacchaeus over for dinner, much less invites himself to his own house. Nobody wants to get near this guy. Jesus says, I'm going to come to your house. Not just you're going to come to my house, which might be clean and proper and right, and I'm going to grace you by letting you come to my home. No, I'm going to come to your house. I'm going to go where you hang out. And notice he says, I must stay at your house. I love those little statements within these things. I must go to your house. There was a, a passage uh, in John where Jesus goes to, uh, it says on his way somewhere he needed to pass through Samaria. Now, no Jew needed to pass through Samaria. Matter of fact, most Jews knew that they, they needed to stay away from Samaria because Samaria is where the, the folks that were half Jewish, half Gentile, the people that were half breeds, they were they were not really accepted by the Jews, but they weren't fully. Gen they, they were they were a mix, and because they were ostracized, they actually worshipped in a different area because they couldn't go worship in Jerusalem. Hence, the conversation that Jesus had with the Samaritan woman. The Jews say we're supposed to worship there. We say we're supposed to worship here. Where's the right place? And Jesus passes by all that and gets to the heart of the issue. But it says he needed to go through Samaria. We didn't really need to go through Samaria. You could have gone around Samaria like every, all the other good practicing Jews did. Good in quotes. Instead, you need to go through Samaria. Why? Because that's where she was. She wasn't going to come out. Matter of fact, she was so outcast that she's collecting water at a time of day where no one else is collecting because she's been outcast. Why? Because she's had multiple husbands and now she's living with a guy. Everything's wrong with this woman. But Jesus had to go see her. Zacchaeus, everything's wrong with this guy. But Jesus needed to go to his house. And so he goes, Zacchaeus, come on down. Hurry up. Today I must go to eat at you. I must stay at your house. And so he, Zacchaeus, made haste. He hurried up. He came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all uh, complained, saying, He has gone to be, with, uh, to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. They all complained. Everybody saw what was wrong with this. Now, Add to everything that we just said, the fact that Jesus is going to go and have a meal with this guy. In that culture, as you probably know, that when you would have a meal with somebody, you break bread with somebody, you are entering into fellowship with them. And in a very real sense in their culture, they would believe that you were sort of becoming one with this person by sharing the same food with them. I mean, it was, it was a very, it was not a light thing to do this. You know, the Pharisees probably thought that they were doing Jesus a favor by letting him come have dinner with them. How backwards is that? Jesus was absolutely doing a favor for Zacchaeus by showing up at his house. But everybody else saw it as something that was horribly out of off kilter. This is wrong. This should not be. How can you do this? And notice it's not, it, they're not pointing out Pharisees and scribes here. Everybody saw Zacchaeus. And they said, why on earth would Jesus ever go be with somebody like that? Now, I don't know what your life was like before you knew Jesus. A lot of you that grew up in the South, grew up going to church, probably grew up in a really nice environment, and were probably pretty good people. Uh, and I was not a bad person, like in some terrible, murderous kind of a sense. But I was not some clean little white smock kid growing up myself, personally. And, and I've, I might have shared this with you before, but there was a day when, uh, when I was in, my, in a bar that I hung out with when a couple of Christian 
people that I knew, that they were friends, but they were Christians and I was not. They saw my car out in the parking lot, so they pulled in and came in, sat down at the bar, ordered a couple of Cokes, and hung out with me in the bar. Now, I didn't come to Christ that night when they were there talking to me. As a matter of fact, I was as embarrassed as anything that these two Christians were sitting here at the bar with me. I must have been redder than anything. And I didn't come to Jesus that night, but they had a lot to do with my coming to Jesus. I'm so thankful that they did this for me. So when I read a story like this, it's not hard for me to put myself in their place and say, okay, in his place and say, okay, what business does Jesus have going into a place like that? He's in the saving business. That's what business he has for this. As a matter of fact, you'll see that as we get to the end of this section. And so he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. But when they saw it, they all complained, saying, He has gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. And then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, 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 I give half of my goods to the poor. And if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he also is the son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Okay? Jesus came in and he spent time with this guy and, and we don't know how much time went by. We don't know the nature of their conversation. But at some point, Zacchaeus had a change of heart and now he has gone and done something that's really kind of incredible. You may not know it so just from reading through the passage quickly. But when, when somebody stole from somebody or extorted from somebody, law required that a certain amount of that be given back with interest. Or it, it, that the amount be given back, but then also a certain amount of interest built on top of it. So when Zacchaeus says, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor, and if I've taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. Now what you may not see in that is that Zacchaeus, without even being asked to do so as far as we know, has gone to the fullest extent of the law in repaying every wrong that he has done. Okay? No one has asked him to do this. But even if I've extorted anybody, I'm going to go fourfold. I'm going to give half of what I have to the poor. That which was my God, I'm going to start giving out like it's candy. And the stuff that, that I've taken from people, I'm not only going to pay it back, but I'm going to pay it back multitudes of times over. As a matter of fact, to the fullest extent that the law would expect, whether or not I even owe that much, I'm going all the way with this. Was he saved because he did those things? No. James said in James chapter 2, Show me your faith without your works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. Salvation came to this man's house. To him personally. And he responded. Evidence was born that this man had had a change of heart. And Jesus said, this is the reason I came. All of you haters, this is why I showed up at this guy's house. I've come to seek and save that which is lost. There's a point where um, Jesus is walking with his disciples and they've been rejected by a particular town. And so James and John, feeling like they were ready to stick their spiritual chests out a little bit, said, should we call down fire from heaven like Elijah, consume these cities? I personally would have loved for Jesus to say, sure, let's see that. Go for it, guys. Let's see what you got. It would never have happened, you know. But he didn't. He said, you know what spirit you're of. I didn't come to destroy men's lives. I come to save them. Now, remember that, because in this next section we're going to look at here, it's important to remember the heart of God as we read this parable. And we'll end with this parable today. Um, but notice the heart of God again as we move into it, as we transition into this parable uh, uh, from what we just spoke about. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Now, as they heard these things, he spoke another parable. So they're still in the same gathering. He is speaking to them. He spoke to them another parable because he was near Jerusalem and because they thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. Now again, like last time, Luke sort of gives us a parenthetical statement to help us understand why Jesus said something he said. Here, Luke tells us why Jesus spoke this parable. It's for two reasons. First of all, because he was near Jerusalem and because they thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. Now the two things are connected, but they're two different things. First off, he's coming near to Jerusalem. And as we have said already this morning, there is a fever pitch that is about to reach a crescendo. His riding into Jerusalem, when he, when he, when he, according to Zechariah 9.90, he gets this donkey, he sits on it, he rides into Jerusalem, he is declaring to the people he is their Messiah. 
Whereas there may have been some ambiguity about some of the things that he's been saying and teaching, there is no question what, he, what message he is sending with this. Absolutely clear. Matter of fact, at one point prior to this, uh, shortly prior to this, his, or his brothers who don't believe in him, they say, why don't you go to Jerusalem and just let everybody know who you are? Just make it clear. And Jesus doesn't. Why? Because it's not his time yet. But there's a specific day, which again we'll talk about next time, but you know the day. It's the day that the Lord has made, the day when Jesus rides in uh, into Jerusalem on the donkey declaring his Messiah. There's a day when that needed to happen, a specific day, a day that could be numerically counted from another day to get to this point. Point A, point B. There's a day when point B happens, and that's when Jesus does it. That's when he needs to come into Jerusalem. That day is coming, and when that message is sent, it'll be so clear as to send the masses out of their minds, as it should. As a matter of fact, if they all decide to be quiet, we find out from Luke as well, that if they decide to be quiet, the stones would cry out. This is the day. There's no way it's going to be quiet and all orderly today. Today is the day of utter worship, mass, nuts, craziness. This is the day to celebrate. This is the day we embrace Messiah. Jesus knows that's coming. Secondly, because once that day came, the common conception would be, he's here, the kingdom is going to be set up now. Now, so Jesus tells this parable to counter those two things, to counter the responses that will come from, from his entering Jerusalem, those two responses. This is why the parable is told. And there's a main th reason, uh, there's a main lesson to be, to be taught from this parable. It's familiar with another one that he told, but it's slightly different. Verse 12, Therefore Jesus said, A certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. So he called ten of his servants, delivered to them ten minas, and said to them, Do business till I come. Now, he didn't give ten to each. He gave one to each of the ten. Okay, so each of them have a mina, or a mina, however you pronounce that. And he says to them, Do business till I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him, saying, We will not have this man to reign over us. And so it was that when he returned, having received the kingdom, he then commanded these servants to whom he had given the money. Now the servants and the citizens are two different groups of people. It's important to notice that. Uh, the citizens did not get the minas. The servants did. The citizens, however, said they will not have this man rule over, this, over, over, over them. Uh, so he called the servants uh, of whom he had given the money and he, uh, to be called to him that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Uh, some of your versions there may say, Occupy till I come. Uh, which is in essence just simply meaning I've given you some, a resource to use. Go invest it and bring a return to me. Do business until I come. So that he wanted to know now how much they had gained by trading. And then they came. Uh, th then came the first, saying, "Master, your mina has earned ten minas." And he said to him, "Well done, good servant, because you are faithful in very little. I, I have authority over ten cities." And the second came, saying, Master, your mina has earned five minas. And likewise, he said to him, You also be over five cities. And then another came, saying, Master, here is your mina, which I have kept uh, and put, under, uh, put away in a handkerchief. For I feared you, because you are an austere man, or you are uh, a stern man. or you're, you're, uh, In some cases, it might uh, send the appearance of you're one who can be harsh when not treated the right way. Uh, you collect what you did not deposit and reap what you did not sow. And he said to him, Out of your own mouth I will judge you, you wicked servant. You knew that I was an austere man, collecting what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money in the bank, that at my uh, coming I might have collected it with interest? And he said to those who stood by, Take the mina from him, and give it to him who has ten minas. But they said to him, Master, he has ten minas, as if to say, Well, he's already got ten. Uh, but I say to you that to everyone who, uh, who has will be given, and from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. But bring here those enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them and slay them before me. Now, there's something to be learned from this parable. Um, first off, again, uh, it's different than the one that Jesus spoke about, the, the parable of the talents. Uh, you'll notice in that parable, there was a very number of talents given to three servants, and the result turned out to be the, sort of the same, where in terms of how they handled what was given to them, uh, the one with the five came back with ten, the one with the three came, uh, doubled it, and the one with the one came, or the amounts, you know, they, they each had their amount, they doubled it, except for the one guy who basically buried it in the, in the sand and said the same thing. I knew that you were a tough person, and I, so I didn't want to lose what you gave me, so here it is. 
And he got, he basically was condemned the same way. Uh, but it's a different parable. It's a different story. In this case, there are ten servants, of whom we only hear about the result of three. But ten servants are here, and each of those ten are given the same amount. The one parable, the parable of the talents, and the talent, by the way, uh, is, is, it's, it's, it speaks of a, 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 an amount of money, much like a mina does. Okay? Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a fortunate term in the sense that it's the word talent, and we think of talent in a different way. The parable literally is speaking about using money in a way that honors the Lord. But there is in principle, not principle like money, although that's a fun pun, but there's, a, there's in principle there's also uh, an application in terms of just resource in general for what God has given you and using it for kingdom purposes. You can certainly extrapolate that without doing any damage to the parable. Here, I think a similar thing can be, although some people have seen in this uh, the fact that all ten were given the exact same thing. The only question was what they did with it. Some have seen in this that, that the minor represents a response to the gospel, a life lived for God, one that responds to what God, that gift which God has given us. Now, I don't know for sure if that's what it is, and frankly, I'm not entirely sure specifically what the minor has to mean. Uh, it's, but I think that's a fair, reasonable thing to assume is being said. God has given something and invested something in you as his child. Now, notice something. The servants that were invested in all belong to that master. I want to also point out at this stage that primarily, who is Jesus speaking to? The Jews. The church does not exist yet. Okay? He's speaking to the children of the kingdom. Hence, a master went to go and inherit a kingdom and come back. Okay? So there's a parallel being drawn here. He is primarily speaking to his own. You remember in John chapter 1, we've gone to John quite a bit today, haven't we? In John chapter 1, it says that he came to his own, but his own did not receive him. Therefore, those who did receive him, he gave, to, he gave uh, the, the ability to become children of God, even those who believe in his name. So he came first to the Jews. Paul makes this case very clear. He came to the Jew first, then to the Gentile. Primarily, and certainly within the confines of his earthly ministry, he is speaking first and foremost to the Jewish people, those who he came to first. Does that mean there's not application for us outside of it? No. But we want to remember the first thing. He's speaking to them first, and they are understanding it from a certain perspective. He is talking about the kingdom. It says to begin with in the parable that he went away to get a kingdom. So that either means he came from somewhere to this place to get a kingdom, or he came here and is leaving it for a time and will come back. In either case, there's something telling. If he came from somewhere, then he's clearly from other than this world. If he's leaving from here to go somewhere else, then at the very least he is saying the kingdom is not yet. But there's time going to pass, and I'm going to come back. So there's something very important there in either scenario. Now, if we do take, and again, you may differ with your understanding of what the mina is, but, but again, there's, there's a lot of different thoughts of what they could be. But if we take, I'm, I'm going to work with the assumption that he's speaking about that which he has simply invested in those who he's called to follow him, those who belong to him. And we're given a choice of how we're going to handle what he has invested in us. You and I are Christians now, and this is where I'm going to build upon what is the ultimate first primary context and just kind of build something that we can actually learn from it as well. I think it would stand for them, and I think it also stands for us. God has invested in us by saving us, hasn't he? He has bought and paid for us. We are his servants. Paul oftentimes refers to himself as a bond slave of Christ. Interesting. Uh, it's, a, it's a term that we can come to understand as Gentiles, but is spoken first by a Jew. A bond slave of Christ. What we do as his servants is up to us, isn't it? It's a choice we have. Will we, in fact, invest that which he has given us in that which will bring him glory or in return, or will we not? Will we be one who feels like, I don't, I don't want to do anything for you because I'm afraid I might do something wrong, or I'm afraid you're not going to be pleased in some way? Jesus makes clear the only way to please God is by doing something with that which he has given you. Okay, Whether he's speaking to the Jew or he's allowing us to, to learn from this parable, that is a lesson he wants us to learn. When he puts something into us, he has an expectation of getting something in return from that. Now, there is a certain amount of contrast here in terms of the master. Uh, God is not harsh with his servants, is he? 
He does love us. We are not only servants, we're children. Matter of fact, those Jews who Jesus came into the world, he came into the world to save Israel first and foremost. That's why he came. It says he came to his own. So they were first given that same opportunity that you and I enjoy the benefits of today. And again, there's a whole theology about that. If you don't understand it, I won't go into it right now. You can talk to me afterwards. But, but there is a point in which Jesus came in the world to save his own. When I say that they rejected him and, and, and he was ultimately crucified and now he works through the church, let's never again make the mistake of saying he's done with Israel. He's not. The time will come when he will once again work through Israel. Uh, but for the time being, we're in the church age. But he came to them first. Gave them the same opportunity that we're talking about right now. He's invested in them. He's invested in us. He expects a return on that investment. He's not harsh, but he has a right to expect from his children that if he gives us something, we'll use it for that which honors him. Whether it's finance, whether it's skills, whether it's talent, whether it's time, time, talent, or treasure, that which he's given us is to be used for him. And he has a right to expect that return from his children, doesn't he? After all, he gave this to us. It's we, we owe it to him to give back. Now, as I mentioned earlier, there's two groups of people here. There are those that are his servants, and there are those who say, we will not have this man to rule over us or to reign over us. Two different groups of people. The one group, something is invested in, and therefore certain expectation is put upon them to bring a return on that investment. The other group will have nothing to do with this man. They'll have nothing to do with this one who would be their, their, their Lord. And so for them, there's also an expectation that they can have. And unfortunately, but very clearly, that expectation is judgment. The contrast is, is that God will righteously judge, but he's not happy about judging. When we read this parable, don't get the sense that God is trying to portray this picture of someone who is looking forward to the day when he can crush sinners and wipe them out and blow them into eternity in hell. That is not the nature of God. How do we know that? Because Jesus came to one of the worst kinds of sinners and said, I've come to seek and save the lost. So the heart of God is such, where he seeks, what, what does Paul say to Timothy? God desires that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. That is God's desire. However, some will not. Some will refuse. No matter how good God is or what God does, they will always, always reject him. And for them, there is only one thing left to expect, and that is judgment. Jesus, in no uncertain terms, makes that point here so that it is clear. And so I will make it clear. There are only two destinations. You know, Nina and I were having this talk, or actually the three of us were at breakfast yesterday, and, and we're talking about something, and the, word, the idea of immortality came up. And we talked about how everybody is immortal. Everybody who has ever lived is immortal. The question is not whether or not you will live forever. The question is where you will spend eternity. But every single person that has ever been conceived in the womb is immortal. The question is where will you spend eternity? Jesus makes the point very clear that there are those who will be judged based on the expectation they have as those who belong to the master. But there are also those who will be judged on the very fact that they do not belong to the master. And therefore there is no expectation of a return on investment because that which was offered to them was never received and taken in the first place. And so therefore all that remains is judgment. And that is an extremely harsh reality to wake up to. But know this, Jesus himself said that hell was created for the devil and his angels. It wasn't created for man, although men will go there, and women. You ladies aren't off the hook if you're not saved. Anyone who rejects Jesus there is no destination in heaven for you because there can't be. I think you could probably argue this a little bit, but C.S. Lewis made the point of saying that, you know, for someone who rejects Jesus, heaven would be hell. I don't know if you could really extrapolate that fully or not, but it does raise an interesting perspective. When the Bible speaks about hell, it speaks about it as a place where the fires never quench, the worm dies not speaks of separation from God, although, as David himself in the Psalms makes clear, you know, there's no place that God isn't. It's not like God's presence does not exist in hell. As a matter of fact, his very existence there, his presence in that place might make it more hell for a lost person than anything. But there's nowhere that God isn't. 
but your relationship with him has no opportunity to ever become anything. It's done. It's this time in this life where that opportunity is given. And the time to respond is today. Heaven is a place that the Bible speaks a little bit about as well, not in tremendous detail. We can't, we can't build a model of what heaven looks like. But heaven is spoken of in terms that by those who have seen it, whether it's Paul or John, of course Jesus himself, you know, um, the fact that Satan torments us out of such vitriol against God and everything, and just the thought of what he has left behind and the, the bitterness that must reside in his heart, there are clues to what how fantastic and breathtaking and without ability to describe that heaven must really be. But in the same way, we only have a glimpse of what an awful place hell is. We do know that the, the rich man who, uh, when Jesus told, what I don't think is a parable, is actually probably an account of a man named Lazarus who died and ultimately went to be at Abraham's side, uh, is now residing in heaven, but the rich man who went to go in a place of torment that one day will be thrown into the lake of fire. And even in that place, which was not a final destination, he cried out that Lazarus be able to go and warn his brothers lest they come even to this place. It's not even hell yet. But please, let me do something to keep them from coming here. Jesus said, <coughs> and here's the thing, Jesus said they already have Moses and the prophets. They have God's word. As a matter of fact, some people are so hardened in their hearts that even if one came back from the dead, they would not believe. That was true in their day, and sadly it's true in ours. There are people today, even though Jesus rose from the dead and has told us of all these things, they will not receive him. At the end of every service, I always like to do this. Actually, I don't just like to do it. I feel kind of compelled to do it. Even though I know almost everybody in this room, you never know if somebody's here that doesn't know Christ. And you, that's not the kind of thing that you ever want to take a chance with. And that's why we give invitations. Some of you may sit out there and think, gosh, okay, I look around, everybody here knows the Lord. You don't know that. There might be somebody that doesn't. It's in this room right now. You know, you might have thought I was a Christian before I came to Christ. I'm glad that some friends of mine at that time didn't, didn't rest with that. So we'd like to give an invitation. I feel compelled to give an invitation. Because someone needs to be saved in this room if they're not. And so we give an opportunity to receive Jesus right now. And all that means is, is that you're going to leave the old life behind, much like Zacchaeus. Here's a guy whose God was money, who had no problem extorting people, taking from people, even though, and, and none of the people he took from had much to begin with, typically, but he had no problem taking from them, which means he was not only an extortioner, but he was okay with it, which is even worse. But this man had a change of heart. When he met Jesus, Jesus changed him from the inside out. That's what we mean. When we come to Christ, we're saying is we're laying down the old man. We're leaving the old life behind. Lord, you're my Lord now. You're not only going to save me from my sins, but you're going to make me new. The Bible says if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. All things pass away. Behold, all things become new. Any of you who have been born again by the Spirit of God know that you are different now than you were once before. And that not of yourselves, but because of what Jesus has done in you now. You've become a different kind of a person than you ever could have been otherwise. And certainly that you ever were. <coughs> And it means that you're going to trust him to lead you through this life. You're not going to rely on yourself anymore to, 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 to earn your way to heaven and somehow earn a right standing with God. You, you realize the foolishness of that now. And you understand the only way you ever get there is because of Jesus. And the only way that your life can ever change on this side of eternity is by surrendering it to him. That's what it means to become a Christian. It means that the Holy Spirit will now come and live within you. And he will make you new. You will change. And if you're ready for that, to acknowledge that you're a sinner and that you need to change. This needs to be left behind. And you need a new life. And remember this, Jesus didn't come to make sick people well. He came to make dead people live. If you are dead in your sin, he's come here for you today. If you'll simply acknowledge that and surrender, fall upon the grace of God. Yes, those who fall upon that rock will be broken. But even as Jesus made clear in this parable, those upon whom that rock falls will be crushed. So don't put it off another day. Let's pray together. Father, I just thank you for the word of God. Thank you, Lord, that you have given us this word that we can learn from, that we can not only hear and sort of mentally understand, but it, it actually engages us at a heart level, at the very core of who we are. We thank you that you have demonstrated both your love 
and also your justice and your mercy. We thank you that you've given grace, but there's also something, uh, there, there's also a, a, an eternal penalty for those who reject that grace. And while that's frightening to think about and may even throw off our misconceptions about who you are, the clarity is something that we have to appreciate from you because it demonstrates how seriously you take it and how seriously you want us to take it. And so you make it clear. And we thank you that in your word you've also promised that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Every single thing that we've ever done that has offended you or anyone else, you will forgive if we will come to you and confess. And not only that, but you'll make us new. We'll be born again, like brought into this world a second time, but this time new, without all the old baggage that we brought. We can leave it behind and have the power to live a life that is different. And so we just thank you for these promises. And for those here today that have never entered into that, They've never surrendered, never confessed, never asked you to forgive, and therefore have never been born again. I just ask you to speak to their hearts right now. Let them know this is the day when they can be right with you. If that's you here this morning, then I want you to pray a very simple prayer after me. If you're ready to confess your sins and be born again right here in this place, then I invite you to just pray the simple prayer after me. Heavenly Father, I recognize that I am a sinner. I have offended you greatly, and I've even offended others around me. And I realize now that apart from you and your forgiveness, I'm lost. I have no hope. But I believe that Jesus came into the world to seek and save the lost people like me and that he might make us new and so like Zacchaeus I want to be made new so please forgive me for my sins as many as they are and make me new I receive Jesus as my Savior and as my Lord so lead me where you will take my life and let it be an offering to you. Thank you for your grace and your love and your mercy. In Jesus' name. And I pray, Father, for those in this place that have been struggling in their own walks, those who have been struggling with sin, those that have been maybe a captive of some sin or another, but have come to know you, and they just they, they realize the, the sin that they're in, and they feel horrible about it, Lord. I pray that you give them the strength, the conviction to set it aside and to walk away, trusting that you will give them victory over it. They don't have to live in this place of condemnation. Thank you for your grace. Pray the Lord you go before us this day, helping us to walk in the newness of life that you've given us. In Jesus' name, amen. Why don't we stand and sing a song together?